Good evening, <coughs> ghouls and fiends. Welcome to episode two of the Ministry of Horror. Uh, we had a great show last week. Um, also, we've had a lot of support from uh, Lawrence and Lee and Andy, all members of the MOS network. Lots of promotion. Um, and yeah, lots of really good feedback. So, this evening, you'll see that I'm once again not alone. This evening, I have with me, uh, he is a writer and director. Uh, I have Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Peter Goddard. Good evening, hello. Peter. Hello. Yeah, hello. Hello. Hi. Because uh, it's a bit of a delay going on when you watch it on live, isn't it? It's a bit confusing, eh? Yeah, so... Like sit, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll get to the live bit uh, a bit later on with uh, okay. with our ranking, but uh, how, how are you, Peter? How are you this evening? I'm very well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, not too bad. How are you, Terence? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Excited okay. to... Uh, Excited to get into our 70s horror ranking, which we'll be doing a little bit later on. But um, first okay. off, I've got a few questions uh, <laughs> I'd like to ask you, which uh, I know is a bit of a surprise. It was a bit of a surprise. I didn't uh, I didn't read your email properly, oh, no. so <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise there would be questions. But, uh, oh, I've got some okay. questions. I've got some questions. Excellent. Excellent. Right, okay. So what sparked your love of horror? Well, in general or 70s horror? Just, just, just in, in general, horror. Just in general. I don't know. I, I, it goes back to sort of a childhood um, love, I think. <clears throat> Growing up, I remember. I think my my like mum and stuff was into horror. She liked Stephen King, and um, I don't know. I don't know. What, I, I I couldn't I couldn't put a start point on it. So it's kind of just always been there. Really. It's always been there. I've always like kind of loved Halloween and stuff, and um, and I remember there was a, a TV series on on BBC Two called Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror, which I saw when I was very very young and <clears throat> used to talk about kind of um like horror films and horror books and stuff like that and I remember seeing clips on there from like night of lynn dead and chainsaw massacre and things like that when i was probably about eight and that's something about that just sparked an interest in it for me excellent um so what would you say i, I know this is always a tough question because uh if, if you're like me the 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 numbers you know the, the films could change from uh, from day to day but if you had to pick uh, mm -hmm. Right now, a top three horror films for you. What would they be and why? I think Halloween would be number one. I think that's kind of an easy one. I think that's just the, the kind of perfect horror film in terms of just everything about it. There's just the the everything from the music and the the, the visual, the style, and the story, and <clears throat> you know that's kind of the perfect horror film in my. Uh, in my opinion, top uh, top three. So number two, probably Night of the Living Dead, just because it's kind of what it did for indie horror and like indie films and that kind of like it. I remember seeing that when I was quite young, or seeing clips from it, probably on Clive Barker's A to, A to Z of Horror, and them sort of thinking, you know, that's something I could go out and make. That's uh, you know, that kind of made the whole thing, the the whole. Um, the whole world of filmmaking accessible because it's just a group of people, one location, and just some good kind of gory special effects. And then I don't know, probably possibly the Texture Chainsaw Massacre, just because of its it's just the overall tone of the whole film. Very kind of it doesn't show anything, but it kind of uses the kind of like the techniques and the especially the soundtrack as well and sound design to kind of like give make it seem a lot more um shocking and more effective in it than anything you can actually see on the film yes yeah, so i think those those three so um a little bit of news that we we're going to put on uh, on the show is that friday i believe it's friday is yep. the release of uh it's now called texas chainsaw massacre the texas chainsaw massacre which is another sequel but it seems to be following the route of the 2018 halloween film and that it's a direct sequel to the original is, uh, it, is it netflix is it, are they doing it is it it's a netflix film yeah it's a i, I, I thought i saw the um posters and stuff for it i wasn't quite sure if it's a, like a series but it's a, it's a standalone film isn't it is yeah it? it's uh set 50 years after the original so Leatherface is in his 70s you can assume um, and it seems to be following that uh, plot line from the Halloween 2018 film where um, I, I remember the actress's name, but not the character, Sally Burns. It's not the same. Uh, uh, who, who was it? Please, Sally Burns. <coughs> Marilyn. 
it's a Sally Burns from our film, isn't it? Um, I think I think the character's called Mar. I think I think it's um, Marilyn Burns, Marilyn. the actress, and she plays Sally. Right, and that's so, well, and, I, and Sally, was it Sally Burns, we I put together for uh, um, Danny's character in in our film. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. So the actress, sadly, the original actress, sadly she passed away. away. Yeah, they recast it, but it's her. She uh, has been waiting for Leatherface for fifty years. The trailer looks. It's like basically the, Halloween, then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> the trailer looks like it could be good, but then there's so I, many bad Texas Chainsaw Massacre films that I don't have. There, high there hopes. was one. There's one a few years ago just called Texas Chainsaw, wasn't it? And that kind of tried to oh, recreate yeah. the spirit, and it kind of it started out. It kind of continued on from the end of the first one, wasn't it? Or something. I remember seeing that and. I yeah. think if they, if they can get like the the tone and the and the atmosphere <clears throat> and the style of the original, then it's when it's when they overproduce stuff. I I didn't think much of the Halloween remake sequel. Oh, you really? know, just happening. Yeah, I it's like the ending shot when he's in the. I don't remember if anybody hasn't seen it, but that that ending shot it just seemed a bit too sort of overproduced sort of i don't well, know well they, they turn him into jason in uh, the most recent one halloween kills yeah it's basically jason he takes on a whole bunch of uh, firemen in one swoop right. i haven't seen i haven't seen kills yet but there's oh. good moments to it it's got some inventive kills some pretty yeah. disturbing kills but it's yeah i i left the cinema kind of a bit like hmm, i'm not really sure what i was expecting but it wasn't really that it's did you like it more than the uh, than Halloween? No, I prefer the original Halloween. But Halloween, it's, 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 why can't yeah. they just give like proper subtitles to these films? It's like Scream, and there's a new one called Scream. Yeah, yeah, I think part of it is they don't want to put people off by having numbers after it because they might they think the consumer might be like, oh god, there's, this is the fifth one. I've not seen the other four. But at the same point, they're continuing the story to a yeah. degree. So surely. But they could have gone with like like Halloween, that. Halloween kills, ha- Halloween ends, and Halloween begins, or something. They, they could have given like a just to call it the same name. It, it seems, especially as it's meant to be a sequel as well to the first Halloween. Yeah. Like it, like if they are rebooting it and starting again, then like with Rob Zombie's Halloween. Well, I haven't seen that yet, but mm. that was kind of like a remake and a, you know. But when it's meant to be a sequel, so you got Halloween, and then the then this twenty eighteen sequel also called Halloween, it just gets a bit. Yeah, I I don't like the uh, the trope of um, having a sequel with the same name as the original. It makes no sense yeah. to me. But uh, yeah, hey, they're they're making the big bucks. They must know something. Yeah. But I will give the new chainsaw a watch when I um, have the opportunity. Yeah, um, same. I think. Uh, I'll aim to do like a review, like a spoiler-free review on it next week. So I'll try and I'll try and put some time around this weekend, give it a little watch. Um, if you had to show someone uh, who's never seen a horror film before, uh, if you had to show them a horror film that you think, okay, they're going to probably enjoy this and it may make them a fan of the genre, uh, what do you think you would pick? <laughs> I mean, there's so many subgenres in there in, in in the horror. So you got your found footage, and you got your slashers, and your so just one. <clears throat> I mean, I'd be tempted to say Halloween again, just because of that's in terms of like that's kind of like the most perfect horror film in my opinion. Um, I don't know, I don't know. But I'll go with Halloween, but then. No, I'll go Halloween. I'd uh, I'd agree. Um, that was probably the first horror film I ever saw. Uh, it kind of feels. I guess this is for everyone when they had their kind of you know growing up period. But I loved the whole uh, Mark Commode introduction to yeah. films, and when Channel Four would have a horror season or a Stephen King season, and it was yeah. definitely the first horror that I ever saw. Uh, his introduction talking about its impact, and um, yeah, you. It's not got the gore that can put people off, the blood and no. guts, uh, but it's got a lot of the tension that you really want from a, a good a good horror film. So I'd agree just, with that. It's just the whole atmosphere, and you know, and it's it's set on Halloween. You've got that the mise en scene, if you want to go, you know, of like Halloween decorations and horror, and 
the use of steady cam and using widescreen and the music and it's just it's just it's the perfect horror film and that's <clears throat> that's all i can say <laughs> i agree with that i agree yeah um so moving on to uh discussing about you now uh when did you decide that you wanted to be a filmmaker am i a filmmaker i mean <laughs> um i don't know i remember growing up i used to be <clears throat> interested in sort of film production i remember i think it was on channel three on you know on a saturday afternoon they used to have like a behind the film kind of a little like a little 15 minute making of type things i remember they had one on demolition man when that came out and I think there's a few other maybe like the Terminator films. They might have had some little behind the scenes stuff. And I, I was always kind of interested in that, that kind of like backstage. Because then I sort of got in when I was at school. I kind of wanted to sort of get into sort of the special effects and the kind of makeup and stuff like that. And then I think probably just going to college and um, just doing media and just enjoying the actual going out of a camera and filming stuff and then cutting it together and so once again I, I couldn't really put a, a particular point on it I think I've always been quite a, a creative person I quite like making something and and um and sort of filmmaking is just something that's always been a good um good way to do that so if you had a dream project to work on that you got snapped up either to write direct both it could be that it's a um, a remake of a favorite film or a sequel to a to a favorite film or even if it's a a project of your own um and you know some hotshot producer goes here's 20 million make the film which is i know in today's money is probably quite small but in terms of you know for making a film is obviously still a lot of money what do you yeah. think would be your dream project oh um <clears throat> i don't know i mean i wouldn't want to if you're saying like what film would i like to have made i mean i wouldn't say i want to remake it but to have created something like blade runner some sort of or or some kind of amazing but then you can do it for 20 million um i mean we've always you never really know i mean when you i've got lots of ideas and things we've come up with scripts before and but you never know what they're going to come out like um i think to have made something something like night of the living dead or you know something that was kind of groundbreaking just have an idea that's kind of unique and um not that i can think of, i've got that idea yet but i don't know I don't know. That, that's that's a solid it's, answer that you know it's yeah. something that comes along and people haven't seen before. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, something like when when people when you, when you first saw something like the Blair Witch Project, or you know, that was like a, an amazing idea done for low budget, and uh, or like even like Christopher Nolan's Memento, that kind of you know that just reinventing the genre or Reservoir Dogs, something you know having doing something that's that kind of like re reinvents cinema. Um, so that'd be cool, but I don't know. I, I, I can't think of like a book or anything like that that I've read that I've, I think, you know, I really want to make that into a film. Um, you know, I've got a few ideas, but, but nothing that, nothing ready really to, to go into. Work in progress. Work in progress, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's like the graveyard shift, which I've had for a while, but I don't think that's quite quite there. Who knows? Okay. One for the yeah. future. One for, yeah. Uh, well, and last, uh, last little question before we move on to uh, our main event for the evening. Yeah. What advice uh, do you have to anyone that's, you know, they're just thinking of becoming a filmmaker. The idea is there, but they haven't, you know, taken the next steps. What would your advice be? Just don't waste your life. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, we're at a point now where, you know, anyone can go and make a film. Like, if you've got access to a decent camera or even, like, you can, you know, it, it's develop the idea, I think, because you, you can make a, a, you know, people say you can make a film on your phone, 
which is true, but then you have to be, you know, you have to make it work for the technology you're using. So, you know, when like, what's his name, made paranormal activity, he only had access to digital cameras. And so he kind of used them to enhance the story. So try and think of an idea which you can make, which is simple, involves a small cast, maybe one location and whatever technology you have, try and utilize that to enhance your idea or the story and just try and do something which nobody else is doing at the moment so don't try and just copy something else just try and come up with an original idea spend spend time on the script spend time on the idea but make it so you can just go out and basically make it for like no money and then you never know it may be the the next uh the next big thing that that takes off and and uh reinvents the the genre yeah, you you don't know until you try. Yeah, and then sometimes just go and you try. I mean, go, yeah, okay, not for me. Just just go, just go and make it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Well, we're now going to move on to uh, the tier list. So last week uh, we had Danny Thompson, and we looked at nineties nineties uh, horror. So lots of slashers, yeah. lots of bad CGI, but like yeah. you know, generally a lot of popcorn films was what we. Uh, we I mean, I grew, I grew up in the nineties. The nineties probably would have been one of my. I think I think every decade's got its its uh, its own style, isn't it? So, like the fifties, sixties, seventies, and eighties are the slashes, the nineties were the the screams and the postmodern, and fifties and were like hammer horror. So there's the you know, there's I, I could have chosen I could have chosen any genre really. So. The uh, the only era that for me doesn't seem to. Uh, have a huge identity when I just think of it off the top is the the twenty tens, like the nineties and the you know the uh, even just the general yeah. sort of two thousands. I feel have their own kind of identities. They kind of cross over a bit. Yeah, twenty tens. I can't really think of. I don't know if it's if it's my you know if I'm getting old, but I mean I grew up in the nineties, so I always remember the nineties as being like the Brit pop and Cool Britannia and film like you know your Tarantinos and stuff like that, and then the eighties were kind of like the back to the futures and new romantic and those those kind of music in the 70s were like you know the kind of golden age of cinema with scorsese and coppola and you had bands like led zeppelin so in the 60s obviously like the beatles and they, you know that kind of or each of those decades has like a kind of unique distinction but then when you get to the 2000s but i don't know if it's just me being old age but then the 2000s to about this day which is like 20 odd years just sort of blurs into this one non-real kind of like there's no kind of identity really like you say oh, it's all, uh, all the music and all the films just don't really i wonder if it's um if it's something indicative M- maybe maybe with our age or maybe it's to do with the rise of uh, of streaming so yeah. obviously when we both were growing up uh, a lot of the films it, you would see would be kept would be on like terrestrial tv or down uh, the video rental place or yeah. HMV, and you'd, you'd, you'd no see the of, titles, make a make a decision. No, no kind of big event films. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like the the big event films are remakes and you yeah, know, uh, re- sequels with the same titles. Uh, yeah, there's nothing. Even, even like music. That, I mean, I don't, I'm going to sound old now, but like music since 2000s has just become. Yeah, the kind of garage bands, the kind of like the strokes the Arctic Monkey sort of the start of the two thousands and then it's all just sort of faded off into kind of pop and hip hoppy kind of Yeah, I mean I I, I like my, my rock and metal and rock these days is classic. It's just looking at the, the, the past and kind of similar with metal. You know, there's metal bands out there but nothing yeah. is kind of standing out and it could be age, but nothing just seems to be yeah. standing out to the stuff that was in the eighties, nineties, two thousands. Um yeah. But rather than us reminiscing about how old we've become, let's but maybe uh, maybe it's due to because technology is so accessible to so many people that there's so much content now. Whereas like back in the nineties and eighties, and you know, if someone there was less films being made, you know, there was less music being being released. But now you just got with streaming and with being able to make films and being able to record music and put it out there yourself, it's just a bit oversaturated. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's so much out there that it's difficult for things unless they've got like a big studio behind them or a big distribution yeah. deal. It's difficult for anything really to stand out. Um, which, which I guess on one hand means that when you do come across something um, which is like kind of almost a hidden gem, that maybe yeah. it means a bit more to, to you as a viewer. But at the same point, you've got more opportunity to miss that film because there's so yeah. much other crap, let's just put it that way, to, uh, to sift through. I think maybe when you had the one really good film, not to ramble on too much, but when you had the one really good film or one big event film, that that lasted for years. So like if when Jurassic Park came out in 93, it was a big summer blockbuster for like the rest of the year. And then it came onto video and then, then that's carried on for like, you know, two, three years worth of it. But when now a film comes out of the cinema, it's there for a month and then it goes on to streaming and then it's like the next big thing's just, you know, a couple of months away. So it, throughout the year, you'll have a lot more content coming out and kind of passing through quicker. We're in that era now where, especially with um, with the internet, and we will move on to the tier list in a second, <laughs> um, especially with the internet, we have so much ac more access to... Uh, what films are in production, uh, what deals have been signed. I mean, now, you know, it used to be uh, a film like Halloween would get released and then maybe, I can't remember the time difference, but maybe like three, four years later, then a sequel just comes out and it's there. Whereas yeah. nowadays a film uh, will get released and maybe even before it's hit the cinema, there's news of, oh, it's been signed up to have two sequels. And so yeah. you as a viewer are then kind of thinking, oh, this probably isn't going to have an ending, is it? Because they're, yeah. they're automatically thinking three, four films film ahead. Back, filming them back to back, and there's going to be released really over the next three years, the three sequels, and and you you know there's no yeah there's no kind of like it doesn't take on its own identity anymore. They kind of d decide that it's going to have this kind of like legacy in advance, and then yeah yeah, and it just I, I think I think stuff just comes out too quickly. I used to, uh, growing up and you know, obviously watching horrors, I used to find it great when uh, you'd watch, like, I don't know, the Sci-Fi Channel, which is what I normally always go back to, the old Sci-Fi Channels where I saw a lot of horror, um, discovering there are sequels to films that you never even knew there were sequels to. Yeah. Um, you know, like when I found out, oh, there's a Halloween 4, I didn't even know there was a 2 or a 3, and, yeah. you know, all, all of that stuff. Um, but, yeah, let's move on now to an it's era of cinema. Yeah. I know some of these, and I've got a couple in here that I know you've not seen, but I have. But okay. the vast majority, I'm going to be having to follow uh, your kind of your score and your guidance on because I That's, haven't seen them. Well, a lot of them I probably haven't seen in a long time, so I might not be able to remember a lot of them. So. We'll, we'll see how we get we'll <laughs> we on. But uh, yeah, so Peter okay. is going to be joining me to rank 70s horror. And as you can see... Uh, by the title when it appears on uh, on your stream. The first one we're going to look at is a film I have not seen, um, Bay of Blood. Mario Barba film. Uh, when was it? 1970 uh, something. Is a uh, kind of seen as like the the grandfather to the American slasher films. Uh, Friday the Thirteenth took a lot, a couple of um, kills from it. So there's like the the lovers being speared on the bed and. There's a guy having a in a wheelchair getting a hatchet in the face. It's a great film. So it, it's it's confusing when you first watch it. It's about if I remember, it's about a group of people who are st stranded on like an island somewhere, and it's something about an inheritance, and then people are being killed off to try and get this inheritance. Okay. I haven't seen it in a while, but it's a it, it's got a great look to it. It's got you know Euro seventies horror to it, and it's Mario Bava and. But he's doing like a kind of a more, a more kind of like straight up slasher. Okay. But no, I, I would I would definitely recommend it. Well, we've got we've got five categories. Um, yeah, we'll we'll start from uh, the bottom. So awful is a film where you just think, I oh, just no way, I would not don't don't watch it, don't put yourself through it. Bad, yeah. you could say maybe it's a film where it's so bad it's good, or you find some element of entertainment in it's it. Yeah. yeah, or or you know it's you just it. think it's not a very good film. Yeah. Decent. We generally look to decent as like that's a good popcorn film, you know. It's not great. You can put it on, yeah. past the time, yeah. Very good. You think it's great, but it's not quite top tier. And then obviously, excellent is is top yeah. tier. Is, is your best of the best? Where do you see Bay of Blood, Peter? It's in between very good and excellent. I think let's just say very good. Okay. 
So I think the one of the few other films you've got coming up would be in the excellent. So it's not quite up there with some of these others, but, okay. but very good. It's, it's, it's very it's an important, very influential influential film. It's got a million different titles like uh, Bloodbath, Switch the Death Nerve, and all these other things. But but no, it's, it's a good it's a good film, and it's and it, it was ahead of its time. So oh yeah, I'll add that to my uh, to my watch list. Uh, the right. next film we're going to look at, and we're not going to do this all in alphabetical order. I'll try and uh, jump around. Um, okay. But we're going to do one where, I have to admit, I feel like a bit of a poser. Uh, I was at a horror convention a few years ago when there were horror conventions in, in Birmingham. Yeah. And I picked up a t-shirt because I thought it looks black metal. love that kind of style. But it was for this film, uh, which is Black Christmas. Tell me about Black Christmas. Once again, this is, a, this, this is another uh, um, landmark it's another. It's uh, Bob Clark. What, what did he? He went off and made some terrible kids films later on in his career, but this is another great film. I really like it. It's, it came out before Halloween. It took a, and Halloween took a lot of influence from it. Um, it's got this the kind of the the killer menacing people over the phone trope, and um, but it's got some great. It's got some great sequences in it. Um, was was this the uh, the film that? Um popularized that uh, that that moment in horror of the call is coming from inside the house i think it was but there was a, there's a lot of films that came around at the same sort of time there's one called when a stranger calls and there was another one called he knows you are, you're alone which i think may have had the same idea i i can't remember if black christmas was before those or after those but it's definitely it gets that's the twist at the end when they're in there and the police call her back and say we've traced the calls back and the killer's in the house sort of thing so yeah but it, it like i said it came out before long before halloween and you know the whole ki- killer pov shots looking through the windows and stuff i think was first in this film so like bay of blood i think it's it's important it's kind of up there it may not be the the high point of the genre but i think it deserves to be in the very good very good three. Uh, just seeing, uh, we've got Crimson Mel in the chat. Hi, Crimson Mel. Uh, hope everyone is doing well. Yeah, yeah, I think we're both good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, now, just a quick question. I'll pop it in very good, as you say. Um, I don't think, to my knowledge, there's been any sequels to Black Christmas, but I'm pretty sure it's been remade a number of times. It was remade, I think, as Black Xmas. Which one was it? They remade it as Black it's either Black Xmas first of all, and then they've made it again with a cast of women. The the most recent one I think is the cast of women, and it's like a sorority cult or a yeah. fraternity cult. I can't remember what it's, if it's called Black Christmas or Xmas or I haven't seen the remix, and no. I probably wouldn't bother. Probably wouldn't but yeah. bother. Yeah, we're going to now look at a film which. Uh, now, something we did on the last stream, we had some films in there which you could argue are uh, maybe thrillers, but I don't care about gatekeeping genres. I think if there's horrifying elements, it can be a horror. Uh, this one had a bit, quite a bit of notoriety, an uh, incredibly famous uh, director. Uh, we're going to be looking at Clockwork Orange. Orange, yeah. Thoughts on I mean, uh, I mean, Stanley Kubrick's probably my favourite director of all time. Um, it's... it's, it's dated quite a bit but it's still a very iconic film came out in 71 which also saw the devils and straw dogs which were all past uncut or i think the devils was cut a bit but they all came out the same year and i think john trevelyan was the head of the bbfc at the time and he got a lot of um backlash for allowing these films out in the uk uk cinemas but I think they opened. I think they're important films because they opened up the what was accept, acceptable in cinema and what was, and then that kind of like it obviously influenced the, the horror genre as to what they could then push the boundaries and stuff. So, but yeah, I think it, it's a cult film. You could call it as opposed to a strictly horror. Uh, so uh, funny you mentioned about the uh, the era that it came out in. One of the films that I was going to do a little uh, review on, and I may do it at the end of the show. I may, uh, I may leave it for for next week and have a bit of just an overall review segment, including Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, there's a recent British film called Censor. Uh, I recommend giving it a watch. It was one of those films where, by the end of it, I thought, 
I think I enjoyed it. It was it was it was all right, but then I had a lot of questions, and I was thinking, mm, okay, I could interpret it this way, or I, it's a film that look, leaves you more questions than answers, but in a good way, and it's very much set during that time of uh, video nasties, heightened British censorship, and it's regarding a woman who uh, had uh, an element of trauma in her past involving uh, her family member going missing, um, and she is kind of taking it upon herself to censor these films make sure that nothing goes out that could influence people negatively and uh i won't go into too much more of it but you can i watched it on prime using a free trial for mubi m-u-b-i is a it's a channel that you can subscribe to on prime i just did the free trial and cancelled but I, i'd recommend for that era given that a watch now back to clockwork orange so going, back, going back to that as you know the uh, guy who edited it mark towns who who, I, who yeah, who I, uh, ironically I buy some um, me videos from from through the uh, video groups. Uh, he edited Clockwork Orange. No, no, no. He edited um, Sensor. Oh, oh, wow. And he also did Saint Maud, um, the the ritual and yes. the Bordens. Oh, wow! Yeah, I, yeah. I quite enjoy all those films. Really, he's a, he's an alright guy. <laughs> I have brought a few 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 tapes from him. Now, Crimson yeah. Mal in the chat has just said. Uh, uh, I know I'm in the minor- minority and I'll be booed, but I don't like Clockwork Orange. I think it's weird and fairly boring. I'm ready to dodge the trash thrown at me. <laughs> uh, I, it's you know. I think I think it's I think it's it's certainly dated and it's it's. I remember seeing it on like a bootleg tape year like but when it was still it was never officially banned but it was like unavailable still. I think it did have a, a slightly I don't want to say cheap look, but it kind of it didn't quite. Like the the English setting and stuff kind of made it seem a bit that the production values weren't as good as Kubrick's other films. But I think uh, numerous rewatches, I kind of I like it more. Um, but I, I you know I think it's I can see why people don't like it, but I personally think it's good. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I like uh, I like Kubrick. I've not watched yeah. all of his films. Like I've not seen like Eyes Wide Shut or the um, the Doomsday films, Doctor Strange Love. Right? Yeah, I've not, I've not seen that. Um, I do like Clockwork Orange, um, but then you know, Space, um, whatever the space one was. Two thousand uh, Space Odyssey. Two thousand Space Odyssey. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. It wasn't for me. I watched that okay. with a lot of high expectation. It wasn't for me. But then again, I love The Shining. Um. And yeah. very different to the book. But where do you see Clockwork Orange on the list? What are your thoughts on I its mean, placement? I, see, I'd want to put it into excellence just because of because because of the i how iconic it is and in terms of it's one of those films which which will be around forever, like a lot of his films. That's fine. We'll I mean, up to you. I, we, 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 would you put it down very good? Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with excellent. It's, it's it? a, I'm happy to go I, with I, I can see why people don't like it. I can see why people find it boring. And that's fine. But personally, I would put it in excellent. That's fine. That's fine. We're, we're going to move on to... Uh... I think we're going to do a director double bill here, and we may follow up with another director double bill. Yeah, so true. we'll go with the more famous one, I would say, first. Uh, Dario Argenta's Suspiria. Yep. How do, what are your thoughts on this film? I uh, put it in excellent. What's the next one? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to be honest, if you haven't seen Suspiria, watch Suspiria, and not the remake. The remake, nah. I, oh, didn't I, think I, I I thought the remake was one of the worst films I've ever seen in my life. I had just, such... I just... No, Got that ending, the ending was just like my brain was just melting. The, the ending kind of felt what's... like have they suddenly run out of money or something? Like did Tilda yeah, Swinton and her three roles take cheap. all the money? Yeah, it went really cheap and with that whole kind of like lot like it wasn't an orgy, I can't remember what it was. But it just was so stupid. The only there's only two moments that I thought, okay, kind of interesting. The uh the I I'll just say the dance room death with the contorting. I thought that was kind of interesting because uh, there's some imagery which I hadn't really seen before. Mm. Uh, and there was a moment where someone is uh, being chased. It might be Chloe Grace Moretz, maybe, I'm not sure, but she's running down a hallway and these kind of black holes are appearing in the floor. Kind of inventive, but it doesn't really mask the fact that it's two and a half hours of my life that I won't get back. Did not like it. 
I like the fact that he changed the tone of it. He didn't go for a straight remake of the colors and he made it look unique and like kind of a Russian and the, the, the color grading was very good. Yeah, it's got quite a contrast to, uh, <laughs> to Argenta's, uh, Argenta's yeah, original. I mean, I, re- I res- respect the fact that, yeah, he went and did his own thing, whoever the director was, I can't remember. But the film itself was just a... Yeah, I can't, I'm sure it's a fairly famous or up-and-coming director for the... Re- I can't remember either, but yeah. I, I don't want to look it up. Cause... <laughs> but the original, the original was just like... It's just everything. Once again, it's like Halloween. It's that kind of perfect... From the camera, the music, the sound design, the lighting, the editing, sound, everything's yeah. just like, you know, it's just it's full on assault. From the very opening scene where Jessica Harper arrives in the, the airport and she's, there's a storm going, and it's just you know, every, making the doors as she exits kind of seem menacing. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a masterpiece, really, isn't it? That's it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Crimson Man on the chat says, uh, "Ha ha, no hesitation. I'll give it a watch. Yeah, highly recommend. Highly recommend." Do you know this crim- Crimson Mail person? <laughs> Is that a friend of yours? Or? Uh, he's uh, part of the um, MOS uh, network. He has a show on the network. Um, he has a fan into the occult, uh, based in the states. All right. Nice uh, to... <laughs> now we're going to go on to now we're talking about doing director double bill. Yeah. Have you heard news that? Um, Apparently, Dario Argento is finally returning to cinema, and this film may not be absolute trash like his last few have been. <laughs> I don't even know his last few were. You uh, made he did Dracula, Dracula 3D. I, that was when I went to Cannes Film Festival. I think that was being promoted so back in 2012 or something. I think that might have been his last his last That's release. Was that his last one? No, I think so, yeah. But he's got a new giallo, um, and apparently early signs. You know, you don't know until you watch it, but early yeah. signs look good. But the other film we're going to do from the 70s... Now, I will preface this by saying I watched this around the same sort of time as Deep Red. I love Deep Red. I like Deep Red. didn't really like this one that much. Um, that's Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Uh, uh, I've not seen it. I've not, no, I've not, I've not seen The Bird with the Crystal. It's got, it, it's got a good title. Yeah. I, like Deep, I think Deep Red is really good. Oh, yeah, I'd love Deep Red. I prefer Deep Red to Inferno, actually. I think Inferno's good, but I think Deep Red... I've not, I've not seen Inferno. I think it's meant to be more of a retread of it. It's a spirit event. It's good. It's, so, it's a, so it's a sequel. It's part two. It's part, part two. of the, the Mother of Tears books. Is it Mother of... Uh, yeah, the Mother of Tears is the third one he did starring his daughter um, more so recently. Three, three Mothers trilogy or something, yeah. isn't it? It's part one and... Third one is... Oh my Mother God. of Tears, Mother of Tears, <laughs> Mother but maybe of tears, yeah. I think maybe it's, that's that's when he went into his crap period. Yeah, it's uh, it it's a weird so, film. It's so it's weird. Been, in, in okay, and Mother of Tears is yeah, avoid Mother of Tears. Yeah, definitely, it's right down there. Um, Bird of the Crystal Plumage. Yeah, it just I... is, is it your standard kind of jalo yeah. sort of? It's it's kind of a retread of Deep Red and and Osgood. A bit like Tenebrae. Tenebrae is okay. I think I think Tenebrae's better. Yeah. Than Bird of the Crystal Plumage. Yeah, it's got some okay. Uh, it's, you know, I think it's a Goblin soundtrack again. It's got some uh, okay uh, set pieces. Um, yeah. But there's nothing majorly memorable. You know, you've got. I think you didn't make it around the same time as like Four Flies and Grey Velvet and around that era. Whole yeah. load of films with similar titles. Yeah, it's. I, actually, it might be one of his first ones. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can't I think it might be one of, one of his first films, Bird with Crystal Plumage. Yeah, it's definitely very early. I think it's seventy-one, maybe or seventy. Right. I, I, I can't. I can't, in good conscience, put this type of Argento film in bad. But I will say decent. Yeah, probably decent. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I probably when I get around to watching it, I'll probably agree with you. I'll probably enjoy it and then forget it. Yeah, it's uh, it is uh, it, it it is what it is. Um, We've now got a film from quite an acclaimed director. I don't actually think I've seen this. I've seen the recent remake, which was very forgettable. Uh, I've only recently started watching some early David Cronenberg. Uh, he's a director that I've n- n- I've never disliked. I do like things like The Fly and um, Scanners. I say I like I like Scanners and Videodrome. I think they're very good. Yeah, um, but I've never really gone on to like you know he's not been like a John Carpenter for me. 
Which one is this in? Is this Rabbit or Shivers? This is Rabbit. I've seen Shivers recently, and that is actually quite good. But I've not That's seen the, Rabbit. Shivers is the one in the tower block, isn't it? Yeah. That's the big slug thing coming out, and it's, it's very strange. That was like his really early one. I think Rabbit came afterwards. That's got Marilyn Chambers, isn't it? Who was a porn actress, and she's on a motorbike. Um, I can't remember too much about it. I've, I saw it, saw it a long time ago. I probably got it on DVD. I probably was drinking whilst I was watching it. <laughs> um, I heard it somewhere. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, it's probably in the decent category. I, I honestly can't really remember what happened in it either. Wasn't there something like under our armpit? There's like teeth or something. Uh, so I know in the sequel, which is an not the sequel, the, <laughs> the remake, which I don't know how closely it follows the original, uh, yeah. beautiful woman is involved in a bike or a car accident. She has to have plastic surgery at quite a specialist clinic. Um, but that then gives her this kind of like uh, growth, I believe, which is uh, basically hungers for human flesh. This uh, sounds like it, yeah. So I think that is, it sounds like it may be quite similar. So yeah, we'll, we'll pop it yeah. in decent. I will give it another watch. Like I said, I've got a DVD somewhere on Blu-ray. Give me, another, give, me, give me another watch. But I can't really pass judgment because I can't quite remember. Well, I, I can't remember if you said if you've seen this one or not, but it's a classic and uh, I, I, I love it. The 1970... Let's see, the 74 78, I can't remember. Um, adaptation of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Starring... Um, Donald Sutherland. Donald Sutherland, uh, Jeff Goldblum, Leonard Nimoy... I I seen it probably when I was around eight or nine. I remember the ending. The ending is iconic. Yes. There's also an iconic moment where someone uh, is sort of being transformed or melded with a with a dog, because um, you see a, a dog running along with a human's face that barks at the, at the main characters. Right. Um, it's I it's I think it's a great film. I don't think it's necessarily sure. excellent, but I think. No. It, the perf- Probably, I think I w- I would need to watch again. And Crimson Mouse is great freaking film. One of my fave movies. I even enjoyed the remake. I is that don't... Body Snatchers or Rabbit? Who are you talking about? Uh, Body Snatchers. Okay. Uh, are you talking about Body Snatchers or Rabbit? Uh, Crimson Mouse. Uh, let us know in the chat. Um, I know there's been quite a few adaptations of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and one which I was going to include in the '90s, but we didn't get to it. But it was my first Invasion of the Body Snatchers film. Was Abel Ferreira's Body Snatchers, the one that's uh, set right. on a uh, military base. Right. That freaked me out as a, as a kid. And that was the, my first... Uh, ah, Body Snatchers, Mel says. Um, yep. That was my kind of first uh, introduction into that story. Yeah. But I think there's been... Um, there was one, I think, maybe 10 years ago called Invasion. I've not right. seen that. I think it's, it's been adapted a number of times. Yeah. So how do you feel about the 1970s Donald Sutherland one? I think isn't that the most iconic one? Just that final shot of him pointing and screaming. Yeah, that's that film. There's some... I, was, I need to give it another watch. I need to give it another watch. It's been it's been a long time. I can I can lend you the film if you like. I think I've got it on Blu-ray okay. somewhere. Um, I, yeah. it's it's it is excellent. Um, once the uh, the uh, the situation starts becoming apparent to the characters, just the real sort of sense of paranoia because you don't know who is, uh, who's a pod person or who's real. The fear yeah. of falling asleep. There's a moment when some of the characters have fallen asleep and you're seeing the creation of the pod people um, just starting to kind of form next to them. And even when a character, uh, unfortunately, they've fallen asleep and they've kind of their body has been transferred into this pod person, they just sort of turn into ash almost. Uh, really, really, really good film. Um, I kind of want to put it in excellent. Do you agree, or do you think it's not quite there? I, it's up to you. I per, personally, I put it. I wouldn't put it quite there. Do you think very good? I think very good. You can, you can put it in the excellent if you want, but then maybe we can move it when these other ones come up. Okay, yeah, agree That's with good. that. If we if we have, yeah, I, I haven't seen it in a long time, so I I I can't really pass that much judgment on it, but. We can, okay. Yeah, we can always move them around. I mean, if we get one of these rows filling up, we can. We the, the rows can overfill, but then it will make the stream. I'll have to start adjusting the stream and stuff. So if we need to move things down or just or chuck them into a wall or whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, make, make a mockery of this whole. Uh... 
this whole uh, whole system. Okay. Now, then. we've got another film where I have only seen the sequel, and I only saw it not long ago because I didn't even realise there was an original. Uh, so tell me about A Town That Dreaded Sundown. I, I, I do like this. So the, the, the remake, you, you've, seen, you've seen the remake. I've seen the yeah. remake, and I thought it was pretty good. I, I think I saw the remake first of all, and I thought it was very good. That the opening is like a long, one long camera shot going through uh, cinema, isn't it? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, the original is very similarly as good, although I can't remember it. I, when did I see it? You watch a lot of films, and they all kind of blur into it. He's the guy. He's got to play. He's got the trombone. He's killing people with trombone. I think, isn't he? Got a bag on his head. The bag on the head. Yeah. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of like almost. Uh, Jason from Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. Yeah, before I think that. that I think that I think that's where they got the idea from from Friday the Thirteenth Part Two from this film. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I I I remember when I was watching it, I enjoyed it a lot, and I thought it was very good. But then that's the same as the remake. I remember watching. It. I think I might have got like a double disc with both the remake and the original on. I watched them both. I th- I Sorry, can't they partially? I know this was a bit of a trope in that time. Isn't it meant to be partially based on a true story? True story, yeah. There's something about a series of killings going on in a town, and and then I can't remember much more about it. But yeah, no, I, it was inspired by a certain degree. Once again, it's been a long time since I, I should have watched these films again, like the night before, to try and uh, refresh my memory. But but no, I remember thinking it was very good when I watched it, and thinking that's one I should recommend to Terence. Do you feel then it falls into the very good bracket? I think decent. 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 It's not quite a good popcorn film, but maybe not massively memorable. No, I think yeah. you got like your masterpieces. You got your very good ones, and then you got your good ones. This is this is a good one. Okay. It's not quite influential. It's not an outstanding. You know, it's good. Now, from a uh, an early slasher to I don't even know what genre you could call this film. Uh, I saw a lot of this director's other work before seeing this, and I I I loved it, but I also didn't really necessarily understand it. That is a Ooh, razor yeah. head. Oh, a razor head. What are your thoughts on David Lynch's debut? Uh, I believe a razor head. I watched it in two thousand and six on a VHS tape, which I borrowed from the Art University in Bournemouth. It was it was unique. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember a lot a lot about it. It was I think once again it's very iconic. It's very I mean it's very ambitious for his first film. I think it took him five years or something. I remember reading about there's a moment where he kept on running out of money and he kept on putting the film film on to hold. And there's like a moment where someone walks down a corridor and goes to open a door, and they go into a room. And between the moment the moment the door and going in the room is like two years apart. And the main actor, he was getting visibly older as the filming went, as the filmmaking process went on. And he got to the point where he was just going to try and finish it up with like plasticine models of the, the, the actors because it, it was taking so long. But uh, yeah, it's a very strange film. It's a, it's a very, it's probably better to talk about than actually sit down and watch. So it's all about the kind of um, the anxiety you have when you have your first child. And just kind of trying to describe that in a very metaphysical, metalogical sort of way that David Lynch does. Yeah, Crimson uh, Crimson Mel says unique is a good way of putting it. Uh, a razor head is something I give him credit for getting it out. Yeah, it's 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 David Lynch's unique vision. Yeah, I've never I I didn't feel the need to go back and watch it again, or you know, but it's. It's certainly, it's it's certainly an original and creative film that he made. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 Decent. Next one. That's what I find with uh, with David Lynch. I love his work, and yeah. I love <laughs> kind of thinking about it, hypothesizing it. But I yeah. I don't really repeat watch like Mulholland Drive. Loved it. Only watched it once. Yeah. It, I, it, I, I, you know, I may go that, back and watch it again. I may go back and watch Razorhead again, but it. With all respect, the fact that he's it's a bit like Christopher Nolan doing for the big budget films. 
making these incredibly original, personal, unique. I mean, obviously, Chris Nolan's more mainstream, but when you watch something like Tenant, which is like, it's not your, it's not your normal dumb blockbuster. It's in, you know, a lot of thought goes into it, and a lot of, uh, and David Lynch is one of those people on, on even more extreme who makes, who is able to make these films. Um, I, I, we should be thankful that he exists and he creates this stuff. Even up, if I, even if not, if I'm not a big fan. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. We're going to talk now about a film which uh, you have a poster of behind you. Uh, Dustin Hoffman in Straw Death Dogs. Death Oh, Straw Dogs. <laughs> I, 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 I love Straw I mean, Once again, it's not really a horror film. Go on, Karen. I don't think I have seen it all the way through, to be honest. You liked it that much. You had to turn it off. I think it was more of a case of uh, catching it on TV, and it was, I think, maybe partway through the almost like rape yeah. scene thing. I do not know what's going on here. Um, so I, I haven't, I haven't really seen it. Tell me about Straw Dogs. I love Straw Dogs. It's, it's, it's like um, Sam Peckinpah. He's making a, a western in Cornwall. Um, it's all about how how far you can push someone until they eventually revert back to their primeval kind of internal rage, which exists in all of us. And it's just, it's a great, I, I, it, to me, I love it. I think it's just a great, unique, not really unique, but it's, it's, um, it's just a very well-made film. It's a very, at the time, very controversial. It's probably still quite controversial now. And it kind of builds up and it's got a great ending. Um, it's very English. It's an English Western, which kind of explores a lot of um, Peck and Pa's Wild Bunch type um, Western philosophy, masculinity, came out at a time when the Vietnam War was going on and a lot of, you know, influenced by that kind of like social, political things. It's a good film. <laughs> it's very hard to sometimes to, to, to describe what you like a certain film, but so the, yeah. the the brief the kind of understanding I have of it is uh, Dustin Hoffman is quite a no I wouldn't say under the thumb type man but he's not like a, a typical alpha male he's a mathematic teacher or philosopher type character goes to this goes back to this um, house in the country which his wife played by Susan George her father used to own and he's very kind of meek and reserved and then these people are there these who used to know know Susan George, one of them is her ex-boyfriend. There's this very problematic rape sequence where her ex-boyfriend is the one who rapes her, but she kind of starts to enjoy it, you know. Um, but then it's all about, and then they kind of like, there's this, this guy who's killed a child by mistake and Dustin doesn't realise that and he kind of like, harbors him in the house and these people the villagers turn up and they're like trying to get the guy out and he's standing his ground because it's, it's his house and then he you know he finally fights back and discovers his internal it's like the it's like the classic anti-hero it's like taxi driver you know at the in the end he's become a man but through violence but kind of lost his soul and his humanity in the process is it's, it's a great film okay so i'm I'm gonna guess that uh, this is gonna be an excellent. No, I was gonna put awful. You're gonna put no, awful. Excellent. No, no, excellent. Stick out. It's one of my, one of my top five favorite films. Straw Dogs. Now we're gonna do another direct double bill. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna as as per the list, I was gonna follow your your placement, but I'm gonna be honest. I'm not a massive fan of either of these films. Um, so the first one, which I think is this director's first one. Uh, is the last house on the left? Tell me, uh, tell me your thoughts on uh, Wes Craven's the last uh, house on the left. Oh, well, these are these are once again these are both both last house and Hills of Eyes, which will be the next one. I, that, these are his best films. These are these are independent guerrilla filmmaking at its best. I mean, when I first saw Last House on the Left, I was a, I was a bit confused. Not uh, it wasn't. I think I was expecting more kind of polished Chainsaw Massacre type thing. But then after several rewatchings, and if you can get the the comedy policeman out of the way, I think it's it's a great film. 
once again, it's about it's very similar to Straw Dogs. It's like a rape revenge film. It's it's about pushing the, uh, the 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 nice family, her parents, to the point of their breaking point and reser- reverting back to their kind of neolithical kind of like primeval sort of like um instincts and you know exploring the fact that this kind of like violence ex- exists in all of us once again the, the whole vietnam war was raging at the time and that was that was like the first kind of like war to be covered by independent news channels who didn't filter out the uh, kind of horrific thing that american soldiers were doing it's the first time that the americans public kind of realized that they weren't the good guys they weren't you know these heroic people going out to fight this war that these these soldiers were involved in doing terrible things and that kind of reflected in the way the cinema changed with films like straw dogs and last house on the left and i think it's a great film i think you know there's just there's lots of moments in it i can see why maybe you don't like it but also it's quite inspiring to me as well watch a film like this when it's just a group of actors in the woods i think um i i can i can completely appreciate that i think uh, my kind of view on it um is and i suppose maybe it's just my interpretation with other directors uh someone like john carpenter who's one of my favorites has quite a unique uh feel and look and tone to his yeah. films that's very much him um and i kind of i suppose i felt with this that my first Wes Craven films are, you know, the Scream, Scream films, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Um, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, I think, was maybe my first, um, my first uh, Wes Craven film. Yeah. And obviously, these were done. This and the next film were done b- uh, way before that. Probably a lot smaller budget. Yeah. But they just feel so. Uh, maybe that's part of the view. They f- just feel a lot kind of grimier. Yeah, but that's what I like about them. You know, I like. I like I've got a book about it somewhere. I like that. I like the kind of raw, kind of visual, visual sort of like grindhouse feel to it. It's not as polished, and it's kind of maybe that's kind of how I like horror. Sometimes it's it's got to be more kind of like Night Living Dead. It's got to have a kind of a more raw, you know, visceral sort of feel to it. Yeah, no, I can appreciate that. Where yeah. do you see this one uh, on the list? I personally would, would say it's excellent, but. Uh, it's down to you. I mean, you maybe. Want it in excellent, we'll put it in excellent. I do want it in excellent. Yeah. There we go. Uh, so <laughs> moving on to uh, his next film, as we touched on briefly. Uh, let me just. I, find I, I, I hated the remake. The Hills Have Eyes. I love The Hills Have Eyes. I think it's a great film. It's, it's, it's taking the same sort of thing: the nice American family being pushed to violent acts that was explored in Last House and kind of polished it and made it a bit more of a toned down film, but it's still, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a great film. And like, you know, his use of traps are on in Nightmare on Elm Street. So Last House have the, the people making traps and there's traps in Hills of Eyes. And I just love the desert setting and the, the, the family what do you think it is about the remake that you hate? Because I have seen the remake, didn't mind it, it, it can't a, remember it. Yeah, it, I think there was like these kind of deformed, deformed, They're more like mutants. Mutant, yeah, mutants kind of over the top, sort of like it gets a bit, you know, kind of glossy, over, overproduced sort of thing, and and you know, I like I like these kind of like raw, like raw, um, more independent. Going out shooting it on sixteen mil in the desert. It was inspired, wasn't it? I believe by uh, a true tale of a Scottish um, kind of Donna, kind of cannibals. Don- yeah, and also the Donna Part was it the Donna Party as well. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, yeah. Was it Donna Party? No. No, I think I'm getting confused. Something else. No, I think yeah, there was a Scottish yeah tribe of cannibals that lived in the mountains. Yeah, but yeah, that that does ring a bell. So, do you think this is on par with Last House or lower? I think is the real question here. <laughs> I would I would put it in excellent again, but that's just me. But I, I I think Last House is the better of the two. Okay, that's fair enough. That's different things. To t- yeah, put it put it up there for now. We can re- we can rearrange later. We're gonna go now for one. Now the the title of it, I believe, 
This is another one of those films that's had many titles. Can you confirm for me, Peter, if Zombie is the same film as Zombie Flesh Eaters? It was called Zombie 2 in Italy, because when Dawn of the Dead came out, that was called Zombie. So when they released it in... Um, it's zombie, it, zombie Flesh Eaters is what it, the most common title for it. But when it came out in Italy, they called it Zombie 2, because Z- Dawn of the Dead was called Zombie, and they tried to pass it off as a sequel. And then they went to... There was some sort of court case over there, and, and they argued that the makers of Dawn of the Dead don't own the word zombie, and so they couldn't copyright it. So they were able to release it as Zombie 2. Hmm, okay. that, was, that was a workaround. Yeah. <laughs> this, um, was this uh, Lucio Fulci? It is Lucio Fulci. Yeah, I, I like it. I love it. It's, it's a great film. I've got, got the preset here. Now, this film... Uh... I think I saw Fulci maybe at slightly too young an age. The age where you're like, oh, I'm into horror. Yeah, yeah, I like horror. And then you see some uh, Italian splatter gore and his obsession with eye damage. And, um, oh, yeah, a great scene with the splinter and the maggots. And the, his his dead look dead and rotten compared to, like, George Romero's in Dawn of the Dead where they're just blue faces. Yeah. Like, it's rotten and they're coming out of the ground. And it kind of takes it back to the... The voodoo kind of origins that the zombie films originally came from. There's that great sequence underwater fighting a shark. Yeah. It's like it's a real shark and it's a real actor underwater dressed as a zombie fighting a shark. It's like it's yeah. And, and then the village burns down at the end. I think I uh, I haven't seen it for so long. I think I did see it once, as I said, a bit too young, and I believe I picked it up on. Uh, I only ever got volume one. I never saw volume two, but I think it was on Box of the Box Band. Of the band. Yeah. yeah, some some gems on there, some not so jemmy gems. Like the first one had more gems on the second one, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think when I first saw it on, going back to you talking about Mark Camo, they had Censored Season on Channel 4, okay. and they had the first night was a double bill with Evil Dead 2 and Zombie Flesh Eaters. Oh, wow. Mark Camo talking in between, and it was like a little talking about censorship and stuff. And then the second evening was, I think, Bad Lieutenant and Salon Kitty. The Tinto Brass film. All oh, right, okay. I'm, I've heard of Bad Lieutenant. I've not heard of the, uh, the other one. It's like Zalon Kitty's like kind of Nazi, not Nazi exploitation. Oh right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I remember taping all that, and that's the first time I saw Zombie Flesh. I, I I really like it. I like the music. It's a it's, where, where it's do you a great goes? film. I'm watching game. Where do, where do you reckon you see it in the in the list then? Oh, you see, I know we've got Dawn of the Dead coming up, and Dawn of the Dead is more of an iconic film than Zombie Flesh Eaters. But I would rather watch Zombie Flesh Eaters, which says more about me. <laughs> so, um, do, let, let's let's go very good. Let's okay, go very. Good. We'll go very good. We'll, we'll uh, put Dawn of the Dead in excellent because that's where it's going to have to go. But well, we'll uh, we'll we'll come we'll come back to Dawn of the Dead. We'll do uh, we'll, we'll do uh, another another one. Um, Okay. Instead, now this. Uh, hmm. Okay, this is a very. This is probably one of the most famous films uh, on the list. There's a few very iconic, uh, iconic ones, but you could probably argue this was maybe the most successful. Uh, Exorcist. No, that is coming up. Jaws. Okay. Jaws. 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 Yeah. You a fan of the film? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, it was like it was the birth of the summer blockbuster, wasn't it? It was the first one. It, was it 74, 75? I think so, yeah. 70 and then years around. A couple of years later, 77, you had Star Wars. So, like, the 70s was like the birth of the, the summer blockbuster of Jaws and 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 um, Star Wars. I mean, what, what is there not to say about Jaws? It, everything's the, the music, the camera work. The story, the vertical zoom where the camera zooms in and pulls out, the acting, the lines, it's, you know, it's, it's a, I mean, you, you, you could argue it's not technically a, a horror film, but then, then you could argue it's kind of like your, like Poltergeist, it's your sort of film you see as you, as an introduction to horror at an early age. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I caught it on TV, maybe a BBC uh, One uh, screening and, um, yeah, the the just the opening. Everything. Me out. Yeah, the um. It doesn't even have a decaying head on the end of the water. No, with his eyes missing. Yeah. I was quite uh, seeing that when I was younger. I was quite seeing the chap near the end 
getting eaten on the yeah. boat. That was, oof, I mean, it's even great. though you look at it now and see the shark and think, oh, you know, God, it's still yeah. a very much, uh, very much a classic. I think, so I think Spielberg used the shark really well. He, he, like, like Toby Hooper with Chainsaw and John Carpenter and Halloween, he kind of underplayed it because he didn't work properly. So he had to only kind of use use it sparingly and. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously going to be an excellent. It's going to be an excellent. You can watch it. The it's going to be here for them in the next fifty years as a landmark film. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> uh, so Crimson Mouse said uh, Jaws. Surprised to see that here. Very good movie, and it certainly made me paranoid about going to the beach. I think uh, I think everyone when they see it for the first time is then maybe a bit more tentative when they uh, when they go to the beach again. Yeah. Um, we're now going to look at uh, a film I don't think I've seen, and if I have seen it, might have been at, like a pizza night, you know, a few years ago around yours, maybe around uh, Peter Vincent's. Right. Torso. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if I've seen this, so tell me a bit about Torso. Do you know, I, I watched it with you around Peter Vincent's house with beer and pizza. Oh, it was, one, was one of them. I've, I've got the shameless release down there. It's the one with the tagline, which is "When so- when whores meet sores." <laughs> I think it, I think there's an opening scene where they're all just it's Italian horror, Euro horror. So I, I instantly love it. Shot in some sort of sunny Spanish or Italian location, um, just naked women. Be it, there's a there's a guy. I'm, I'm pretty sure they all blur into one actually because you got you got what have you done to your daughters and you've got. All these other ones. There's, a, I think, it's the one the, the motorcycle. He's got the helmet on. He's on the motorbike driving around and he's killing um, women who are like models or something. Oh, it's, I, I, like, I like. I could watch it right now. <laughs> where Where do you see this one going on the list, torso? Let me just quickly read the. Oh, let me try. Uh, what's it about? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, is that one? Yeah, I always warning. get it mixed up in my head with pieces. And strip new for your killer. Oh, pieces as well. I love pieces. Um, is it the one I'm thinking of? You, I, 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 oh, I, I think decent, decent. But I could watch it more times than other films. <laughs> more times than a razor head. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to look now at a film we mentioned uh, a bit earlier on. I, well, we, we had a bit of a deep dive Um you know, briefly in in uh, in the franchise with the new one coming out, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre by Toby Hooper. Yeah, I mean, should we just go straight into excellent? Yep. Yeah. What's next? It, it, <laughs> like I said, I said it earlier, it's all about you know, it's everything from the opening image of the what is open on? It's a sound, it's a the sound, road freaking road sound, the the flashlights, isn't it? And the, the corpse, and this, and then they've got the sunspots on the moon and. The armadillo and just everything about the it's more people think it's more violent than it actually is. I think four people die in it. There's no very little blood, and only one person dies of a chainsaw. And the thing is, I'd That's... probably say those four deaths are all very unique and yeah. scary. Um, yeah, the I think it's probably one of my all time uh, favorite. Well, I say favorite, yeah. just uh, freakiest is that the first kill with the hammer. Yeah. Just because in this creepy just setting, the camera shot, the camera going under the swing, and the house grows bigger because of the angle and the tracking, and it starts to the, the characters get yeah everything. Uh, the Fra- Franklin's death in the wheelchair that always yeah because the tension is really ramping up at that part, and you know he can't go anywhere, and oh that was yeah, yeah excellent excellent. We'll, we'll... The only person who dies, the only person who dies of a chainsaw isn't it Franklin? He is yeah yeah. We got hooks, we got hammers, hooks, hammers. Chainsaw. Who else? Who else is someone? I'm pretty sure there's four kills in it. Someone gets run over by. The hitchhiker gets run over hitchhiker by. Hitchhiker gets run over. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then there's, there's just that constant. Um, and it, you know, um, Sally Burns constantly trying to escape, and then in the back in the house and back, you know, yeah, yeah. Out grandpa and with the escalates. hammer keeps dropping it. Yeah. Yeah, it's excellent. It's, it's excellent. excellent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's now look at. Uh, okay, this is one that I have seen. I really don't remember much about it, other than thinking, okay, this is kind of creepy, but also kind of weird. Driller killer. 
Yeah. What are your thoughts on Driller Killer? I've got that. I've got that. I've got the, got it, I've got the preset. The original Vipco, Vipco release. Ah, oh, Vipco. Oh, yeah. What happened to that company? Um, <laughs> VipcoVaults.com, get all your DVD needs then. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I like it. I don't, I don't want to watch it again. <laughs> the thing that I remember most about it that didn't, I think it was also in the uh, vault, uh, the book of the band or whatever it was, the box of the band. Yeah, box of the band, yeah. Um, I just remember watching it and being like, I don't like how sexual this guy's being with the the, the drill. I'm sure he's right. like gyrating on people and he's like drilling them, and not for me, not for me. Uh, That's um, all I remember. I mean, it's, it's Abel Ferrara again, isn't it? And it's it's kind of like, I think let's just put it in decent because it's iconic in certain parts. It's, it's it's well made. It's a, a grubby New York sixteen mil look to it. It's as good as it is. A little bit boring. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lesbian shower scene. <laughs> and a, a trap is being drilled. Um, yeah. It's 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 good. It's good. Okay. Just wouldn't you know go and watch it again well, anytime soon. We're going to reel out some uh, a few more. We're going to reel out some of the the classics, and then we're going to look at what is the top, uh, what is the top of the list. So, yeah. moving swiftly on, um, this is a film I think is okay, but I want to hear your opinion, and that is the adaptation of Stephen King's first novel, Carrie, by Brian De Palma. Oh, I thought it was kind of boring, to be honest. I think the ending is, you know, it's it's iconic, but the majority of the film, for me, I, yeah. I remember this. I remember the opening in the shower, obviously, <laughs> and I remember the ending, the, the split screen, and the telekinesis, and the bucket of blood. I need to watch it again. I haven't seen it in years. I've got I've got that the Arrow special edition box set up there, so I've got no excuse really not to have watched it. But. I think, see, I would, I still go very good. We can put it just, very just, good. Just because you know it's, it's iconic. It's become pop culture reference. I think Brian De Palma does go a bit excessive sometimes. Probably like Scarface, isn't it? That other De Palma film, which is very iconic. But when you actually sit down and watch it, there's only certain bits which are really iconic, like the ending. The end, yeah. The rest of it is like it, like Scarface, the, the build up to the end, and there's some good scenes in there, but yeah, I mean the whole the whole <laughs> bit in the um, in the gymnasium, and then the very you know the last little jump scare, uh, yeah, yeah. Cr- Crimson Mouses, yeah, carries. It's a very slow burn, but the ending is iconic. Um, so, yeah. So do you you reckon very good? I think very good. Okay. Uh, moving. I watch it again. I might change my mind after watching it. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, another one which you may say for the majority of the film isn't horror, but I thought the ending was uh, was terrifying when I first saw it, and I think it still holds up now, although I do think elements of the film, or not elements, sections of the film are quite dull. But I still kind of love the film, and that is Don't Look Now. Tragic film uh, starring Donald Sutherland. Um, great sex scene. The, the, the great sex scene. <laughs> 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 um, and also, yeah, the finale just, uh, it, it freaked me out when I first saw it. Yeah. I didn't even see it young. I didn't even see it like a young yeah. youngster. Um, I heard about it in film class in uh, in college and start watching it and thinking, okay, it's quite a, quite a tragic film and, and whatnot, but it gets to the finale. You're on tender hooks and yeah. the reveal... Of what is going on, I I thought was I thought was terrifying. What how, what do you think about Don't Look Now? I think it's excellent. Yeah. I think just the, the, you know it's one of those films that you can pull apart and study each scene and each sequence, and which as someone who's interested in film likes to do probably more than your normal person. But like the use of color, the use of like just the opening sequence and the color red and the Venice locations and their. John Sutherland and Judy Christie's performance in it, and there, but there's point in their marriage which is breaking down, and 
and they and, and you know it's a really tragic moment you know it's at the ending where it, yeah if you haven't seen don't look now it's uh it's a key piece of cinema and sometimes horror gets looked looked on as 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 less than in the cinema this is elevated horror before it became elevated horror yeah. <laughs> it's it, it is yeah, up it's, there it's a great film it is a, you know just just the music as well and the everything in english it starts out in england and it? it's nicholas rogue isn't it yeah yeah i really like walkabout leader as well which is also another film which is hard to describe why you like it but yeah, i like seeing that one i think i think don't now is that up there with the excellence we got. I think we're gonna do three more as, uh, three more. as we're we're, okay. we're we're cracking on a bit with time. So we've got a few which we haven't touched, but uh, we will we'll do these three. Uh, now this is one that uh, was mentioned. Oh, we'll make it four, but we'll make it a quick four. Well, then. Halloween. We can't have a list of seventies horror and not have Halloween. I think decent. I mean, it's alright. Isn't it? <laughs> Who's <laughs> <laughs> no, Of course I'm wrong. What he said is that the most perfect horror film of yeah. all time. Isn't it? We, we, and it's kind we, of interesting. When was it? Was it 78? Something like that? I think it was 78. Because the, so the sequel was 81. Yeah. I think this but it's interesting. If you look at like... like I talk about Night of Living Dead. Night of Night, Living Dead came out in 68. And that was the kind of turning point in horror cinema. Because before that was kind of like films were like um like hammer horror films and they like the monsters were from like faraway places and they were like myth- mythical logical kind of c- creatures and things and like dracula and frankenstein and then nine nine limb dead brought back horror to like home and like made it about people that live down the street from you and they you know is people like you and it's 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 and then that kind of led on to the the, the films of the 70s and halloween's the film it, it, it invented the the 80s slasher craze, even though it came out in the 70s, and Night Limb Dead created the the kind of Vietnam War kind of like influenced kind of like um, violence in study study of violence in films, which kind of you can see through the 70s, even though that came out in the 60s. Is my ramble. <laughs> <laughs> so no. so Halloween Halloween is kind of like you know the reason why you had all the slasher films in the 80s, but it's a 70s film. Yeah, it's, it's just <laughs> iconic. It's just iconic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to go on to The Omen. Right. What do you think about The Omen? I need to watch a game. That is, um, I mean, um, yeah. I, for me, my gut is very good because I yeah. love the story. I, I'm very much, I mean, as we mentioned earlier on Crimson Mal, there's a lot about the uh, the occult and that area of things. And I, I've always been very interested. Like, I'm not religious in the slightest. But I find the whole um, imagery and story of this kind of like, Lucifer and the Antichrist and um, uh, th- yeah, the original Omen. Yeah, it's um, I-, I think it's a great film, but it's it's again, it's not one that I routinely go, oh, it's, it's Halloween, I want to watch the Omen, or you know, yeah. let, let's give it's it a probably, rewatch. It's probably a little bit too polished for my yeah. Would you agree? Uh, very good. Yeah, but but it's very good. Okay. It's because it, it's because it it was it kind of came out as a response to another film which I'm sure is coming up in a minute, which will be in the excellent category. Uh, is that The Exorcist? It will be The Exorcist. Yes. yes. Now <laughs> I was gonna do a little bit of a pre preamble on The Exorcist. So I remember renting it on VHS when it uh, got released again in the UK. Yeah. It had been banned for uh, for a while. Yeah. It had the hype of being the scariest film ever. Um, and so my um, my expectations were high. Yeah, I didn't appreciate it when I first saw it. I thought oh, it's not really that scary. I mean, there's a couple of bits which are a bit unnerving, but you know, yeah. it wasn't. It didn't really do too much for me then. It has over the years and over repeat viewings become one of my favourite horrors of all time. Okay, yeah. I think it is the ultimate battle between good versus evil. Yeah. Um, I think the flashes, the uh, the cut, the quick flashes of the. Uh, Pazuzu's face yes. um, are brilliant. There's elements that I never even noticed or appreciated when I first saw it about uh, uh, the actress's friend. What was, was a line about um, go out, can you spare a something for an old choir boy? Yeah. When he's, that is it just a little moment that flashes back to earlier on in the film. But once again, like you, I mean it's never been a film I really loved and you know, like there's certain horror films that I love and but I 
certainly appreciate it and I think it's an important film. I remember it was one of the films that kind of got me into the kind of video nasties and stuff. So I remember, I remember there was a guy, if you remember Diamond Free Ads, remember that? Yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, that, that that's how you used to sell things, how you used to sell things before eBay. You put an advert in this, this paper that you could then ring up someone like if you want to buy an old mattress or whatever. And I remember at one time flicking through it and someone was in there that had listed The Exorcist, £15. Here's my phone number sort of thing. This is when it was still banned. Oh, right. So, yeah. So, and I think my friend got in touch with the guy, but no, actually, he didn't, I didn't think he actually brought The Exorcist, but he ended up getting a catalogue from him and we brought films like The Chainsaw Massacre and Clockwork Orange and Last House on the Left and all these kind of like films which were still banned at the time. So, but yeah, I think I, I think I first saw The Exorcist when it actually finally got a stiff cut. Yeah. James Furman finally left the BBFC. Much praise. Because it was one of those films on his hit list, wasn't it? Yeah. Straw Dogs and Chainsaw Massacre, I think, was the three on his hit list, wasn't it, that he would, would never release for no real good reason. I mean, even though the novel it's based on as well uh, is... Uh, the, the first film to be nominated for Best Picture, first horror film to be nominated or to win Best Picture, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think, I think it was the winner for win that. Did it win it? I think so, yeah. Um, yeah, like I, I, I say, yeah, when repeat viewings, um, I've become, uh, you know, appreciated a lot more. When I first watched it, I wasn't really paying attention to too much of the, yeah. uh, of, of the plot. Um, but there's so many different little things that I've then picked up on repeat viewings, not just like, you know, the flash imagery, but uh, also like the story elements. I never really appreciated the the mother wasn't just trying to protect her daughter because her daughter's been clearly possessed, but also could she be implicated in a in a, in a murder? Did uh, did her friend's death, was that, right. that was because the, the her producer friend was found at the bottom of those stairs with his head twisted all the way around? So basically, possessed uh, possessed Regan had killed him. So there's other there's you know there's a lot of things which I never really appreciated on the first viewing and repeat viewings. You know I I think it's uh, it's excellent. Do you agree? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, we will do <laughs> two more. I think there's yeah. one. There's there's two that I definitely think we can't not have on the list. Okay. Uh, one we haven't mentioned and one we have. We'll do the one that we have mentioned. Uh, we mentioned it when talking about zombie flesh eaters and that is we'll do the theatrical, because I think there's a th few different cuts, the theatrical cut of Dawn of the Dead. Right. George A. Romero. I, I couldn't tell you what the difference are between different cuts. There's uh, Dario Argento one, isn't there? I think there's the, the score is slightly different. The Argento Goblins. one is uh, it's just a couple of slightly yeah. longer scenes. There's not a huge amount of variation. Yeah. I, it's a good film. It's, I mean, it's an important film. It was, it, it was about the rise of consumerism and stuff in under, under Reagan. Was it was it Reagan? It was Reagan era. Yeah. It was like they filmed it in the very the very first mall that was being built at the time, which in America, um, and it's all about you know people's obsession with buying stuff. But they couldn't really afford and these zombies kind of mindlessly going back to this this mall where back to the things they did when they were alive except they now yeah. want to eat flesh and they want yeah and that, they did, these people are stuck in the mall and first of all it seems great because they got all this stuff and all they, they own all this stuff and then as time goes on they become more and more bored and it just becomes this kind of meaningless existence and I just think it's let down by the the, the zombies themselves uh, just, well, that's just my the blue face zombie thing. It just it, it's... just to, uh, to jump in, going back to The Exorcist. Uh, Crimson Mal says that the person who inspired the movie, Roland Doe, real name Ronald Hunk Hunkeller, uh, had passed away recently. Um, but he actually went on to work with NASA. Um, who, who is Roland Doe? Was he the so the, uh, the, the the vicar? No. So The Exorcist, um, the the novel, which obviously the film was adapted from, yeah. was based on a, a real life case of yeah. a young boy, Roland Doe, who's real. Oh, right. He was the boy that was actually possessed. I think mean, not the, yeah. the person he's reading. Oh, so well, he's yeah. recently passed away, but he worked for NASA. There you go. Um, I'd agree with your assessment on Dawn of the Dead. Uh, my favourite of the George A. Romero trilogy, because I'm not really a fan of the uh, the later trilogy if you, if yeah. you call it that I think Land of the Dead has some moments but there's a lot I didn't really like about it yeah. um, my favourite of his trilogy is um, Day of the Dead Yeah, it's the more downbeat overall uh, in terms of it's just kind of hopeless, yeah. I think that's part of the story but the zombie effects are just 
insane in that film. They're so yeah. good. Uh, and Dawn of the Dead, I think it has a great story, a great setting. The characters as well are are really quite quite good, quite well rounded. But yeah, yeah, the zombies are blue face, grey face. Some of the some of the kills and the bites are are quite good. Yeah. But the actual zombies themselves, I think, especially in today's lens, I I, I just think that I just prefer. I'd rather watch Night Living Dead. Yeah. I think it's just got more of a raw, visceral, <laughs> as a, my favourite fa- 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 um, phrase. But I don't know, I prefer Night of the Dead. I think it's more of a atmospheric horror film than Dawn. So but, but people love Dawn. People rate Dawn as being the best of his trilogy and all that. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they, they, yeah, it's... Um... It's a great film. It is a good film. It's a good film. You know, you know, where, do you, where do you see it on the list? Should we do very good? I think very good. Uh, just, yeah, you know, excellent. if... Uh, excellent. excellent to me, really. Yeah, like I say, Day of the Dead is my is my favourite of that trilogy. Um, and Dawn, Dawn is, is, is a good film, it's really good, but uh, it's not my favourite of his. Um, we're yeah. going to do one more. We have got a few more on the list, but we're going to just do one more because uh, we, we don't want to be here all night. We've got to think we've got yeah. one in the morning. Yeah. Um, we are going to do The Wicker Man. And not the Nicolas Cage. The bees! Oh my god, the bees! Start a Star Wars going on! <laughs> <laughs> He's just going around punching women for an hour and a half and then getting his legs broken and having bees put on his head. He is drops on the, the people downstairs explaining the plot and he's there going, I'm starting a Star Wars going on! <laughs> Flashback to go in uh, the he couldn't save on his motorbike, he was hit by a van or something like oh, that. God, um, it's... it's great though. I could watch that. Anyway. Um, yeah. It's a very strange film, isn't it, The Man? I, I love it. I love British horror films. I love British folk horror. Blood and Satan's Claw was also on the list, wasn't it? We can it's get enough. that one in as well if you want. If you want to do a quick, uh, get to that quickly. Do, 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 do both side by side, I think. Okay. So, 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 so Wicker Man, a brief, real brief uh, synopsis if people don't know the kind of general tale. Policeman goes to Ireland looking for a missing girl. Turns out that he's all a plot. No, I, I, that, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to ruin it for you. Um, he's, he's searching on his island for this missing girl called um, Begin of an R. Yeah, I can't remember the name. Ro- Rowan. Rowan. Rowan was Something a girl. Like yeah. Played by Edward Woodward. Um, Christopher Lee's dancing around in a dress. Um, and it has it, it's, um, lots of um, British folk pagan traditions and stuff like that uh, are all being um, coming up. In these, with these islanders, um, and then it's all he's, he's trying to find this girl, and it has the big iconic ending yeah. and some songs. Did you? Uh, I, I know that there was an idea uh, for a sequel which sounded batshit crazy, and they did actually do Christ, Christ for Cowboys. They did, yeah. Christ for, is um, because it was written by William Schaefer. Schaefer, he came up with the idea and stuff, but then it's directed by Robin Hardy. Mm. One of the criticisms people say about it is the direction isn't very good, even though the original idea and script is very good. And then Robin Hardy, who was the director, who didn't write the original Wicker Man, he wrote a book called Christ for Cowboys, which was a sequel to it. And then he ended up making Christ for Cowboys as a sequel, even though he, it is really Anthony Shaffer, who I think passed away a few years ago, was his original idea. So really, he should have been the one doing the sequel. There was yeah, I, all I remember. I know that there was yeah, there was the film, but I remember an, an an idea for the sequel was some sort of bird or mythical thing saving a particular character from a particular doom, which just sounds. I have no idea. I have no idea it's a bit crazy. So where, where 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 do you reckon this is on the list, and then we'll get to which finder? We it should be an excellent. Have we got enough room? I think we should, we should shift. shift uh, it's fine. We yeah, haven't got. Put, he'll, he'll put hills of eyes down into. Very good. Well, oh. we haven't got anything in awful or bad, and I doubt we will. So I think we can have a big, excellent list. Uh, it's just it cuts off the bottom, but we I don't think I don't think Blood okay. and Saint Claw is going to go into awful. And Blood and Saint Claw, very good. So yeah, anything anything you want to? I have seen it. It was a weird film, but I did enjoy it's it. Weird. Yeah. It's uh, once again it, it has lots of uh, British folk cult sort of ideas and I think it's, it's let down a little bit by the ending I can't really remember it yeah but, but it's got good music it's got great visuals it's a great story about 
there's it's about this the devil isn't it or something and he's, he's um infecting the, these people and there's yeah it's have a rape scene in it it's 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 an odd film but it's uh, kind yeah. of classic british uh, folklore yeah where do you see this one on the list pretty very good very good okay very good. um and we will just do one very very quick one because I've never seen it, but I know you you may have seen or you know the notoriety of it. The Devils, I think it's called. Devils, yeah, that's the that's the third film that came out in seventy one, along with Straw Dogs and Clockwork Orange. Now I've seen this twice, and I can't remember. I think Oliver Reed is there's a bit where he's got an inflatable crocodile. Oh, really? <laughs> I might made that up. Is that or, or was that a story that? Cause I know Ken Russell was he lived local. He lived in Brockenhurst, didn't he? Oh, really? he's to, yeah, he's, he used to go into this when I was at college at Brockenhurst. There was a, a bookshop called Bestsellers Bookshop, and the guy in there said that Ken Russell used to come in quite a lot and would, used to tell him about he was trying to make a film in his garage. It might, that might be in the film actually with an inflatable crocodile in his garage <laughs> to, with the, the House of Usher or something because he couldn't, couldn't get a fund anymore. All right, but The Devil is a very strange film. It's um, I've got the DVD. I've watched it on preset tape many years ago it's still never been supposedly released fully uncut is that fully correct oh uh, yeah mark commode champion for years need to try and get it fully uncut release um i would need to sit through it again i think it's it has it's it's, it's very visually st- sort of stunning i think there's like yeah it's about but is it some nuns that go crazy Oliver Reed thinks they're possessed. That's kind of a bit sexy. <laughs> <laughs> and he ends with him being, yeah. I need to give it another watch. I've got it on DVD. Where do you uh, where do you see this then? I, I have, until I watch it again, I, I would just put it as decent. Decent. Okay. Well, we're going yeah. to do no more uh, films added to the list, but we're going to do very quick fire. I'm going to ask Peter what he thinks is uh, the best, and we're going to do it kind of one against the other. So, Peter, is Clockwork Orange better than Suspiria? No. Okay. Is Invasion of the Body Snatchers better than Suspiria? Why is no. the place moving around? There we go. Uh, is Straw Dogs better than Suspiria? Yes. Well, let me move that around. Is Last House on the Left better than Straw Dogs? No. Is The Hills Have Eyes better than Straw Dogs? No. Is Jaws better than Straw Dogs? Yes. No. Not to me. <laughs> but it is. <laughs> is The Texas Chainsaw Massacre better than Straw Dogs? Yes. Yeah. Is Don't Look Now better than The Texas Chainsaw Massacre? No. Is Halloween better than the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Halloween should be number one. So put that at number one. <laughs> is uh, The Exorcist better than Halloween? No. Is The Wicker Man better than Halloween? No. Okay, well, there we have it. We have. I put Wicker Man round. I'd swap Exorcist and Wicker Man round. Uh, but then I'll put Invasion of the Body Smashers last. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. Excellent. Okay. Next bit. So Halloween is the best film. Ranked by by myself and Peter Goddard of the seventies. There you go. Okay, Peter. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I thought you'd do a ball like put a ball in some sort of ball. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. no we don't want to be here all night. We don't want to be here all night. Okay. Um, I'm just going to briefly chat about what I've got coming up on the show next week. So I'm going to be joined by a Twitch streamer and member of the uh, the MOS network. Um, I've co-hosted a show uh, with Lawrence uh, previewing. Uh, I can't remember which WWE show it was. Um, but it is Twitch streamer Erratic Agent, and what we're going to be doing, we're not going to be doing a tier list. We're going to be bringing to the table our personal top five zombie films. But I don't know what his top five are. He doesn't know what mine is. So we may have some crossover. We may rank the same film one higher, one lower. But it's going to be an interesting discussion and dissection of horror films. Uh, pe- uh, not just horror films, sorry, zombie films, to be more specific. Um, Peter, thank you very much for coming on this evening's show. Thank you for having me, Terence. It's been a pleasure. Where can the viewers uh, watch uh, watch your films? Um, uh, all over the place. 
<laughs> so you've got um, uh, some of Prime, someone like um, different companies have released them. Vipco have just put out a Harvest of the Dead Halloween Night. So I'd go to www.vipcovaults.com and buy at least 20 copies of that. Get a free uh, A3 poster as well. Get a free poster. You know, if, if you're lucky, the director might sign the uh, or directors might might sign the uh, the DVD. If you want it devalued. Yeah. <laughs> it could be worth any less than yeah um <laughs> uh there's some if you if you really want to i think there's stuff on amazon prime things like that yeah so you really you've want. got um uh, to watch <laughs> you've got season of the witch uh don't look now and uh also the original don't look now, no, was it, it, it was anna anna now. Now. it's called anna and the dead i wish i made don't look anna now. and the dead anna and the yeah. dead yes um so check oh. those out um, Crimson Mouse is good stuff. Peter and Tez very much enjoyed. Thanks for watching Crimson Mail. Oh, thank you. Thank you for thank you for coming along and, and commenting. It made it made it seem like it was a uh, worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it did. It's nice having you here. Thanks, thanks, Crimson Mole. Yeah, thanks. For I'll buy much. a drink if I ever see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, like I say, we've uh, we're going to be talking next week about zombies. Uh, I'll do some reviews of a couple of films I watched recently. Also. It's going to be interesting to... Uh, I've got to do a spoiler-free discussion on the new Halloween, which I... Not Halloween, what am I talking about? Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre being released on Netflix on Friday. Um, so talking about other shows on Wednesday, uh, Andy is here on the MOS Network with Retro Chat. Uh, he did a great show last week about the new adventures of He-Man, a bit of a retrospective discussion on that uh, that animation. And then Sunday, of course, you've got Lee and Lawrence uh, on the Ministry of Slam at 7 p.m., so thanks again and uh, see you around.